Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us today here in person as well as on the web. Uh, my name is Benjamin Lennett, and I direct the policy team here at the New America Foundation's Open Technology Initiative. Uh, let me just say a brief words about New America uh, before we get started, and then I'll turn it over to Daniel to uh, introduce the event. Uh, new America is a nonprofit, nonpartisan public policy institute that invests in new thinkers and new ideas to address the next generation of challenges facing the United States. We have programs that work on a range of pressing public policy issues, including national security, education, health care, and economic growth. My program, the Open Technology Initiative, formulates policy reforms to support open networks and open source innovations. We promote universal and affordable communications access through partnerships with communities, researchers, industry, and public interest groups. And we are committed to maximizing the potential of innovative open technologies, particularly for poor, rural, and other underserved constituencies. At OTI, we very much share the goal of the 550 Challenge to realize the promise of the internet as a basis for a communications renaissance, and to ensure that no matter who you are or where you are in the world, you can access an open internet that empowers free speech, free expression, creativity, and access to information. It should be a great discussion this afternoon. Uh, we have a tremendous uh, panel of speakers. Uh, so without further ado, let me turn it over to Daniel to get us started. Okay, thanks, Ben. Uh, so my name's Daniel Berninger. I'm a communication architect based in uh, DC. And the idea with the 550 Challenge, essentially a reaction to um, just observations over the years, that the internet, as, as the internet advocacy is coming off of uh, what's considered one of the bigger victories in terms of pushing back on uh, legislation, the SOPA and the PIPA, but if you look at you know, the debates as they've played out, for the most part, the internet advocacy has been reacting to someone else's agenda. And, and so it's kind of hard to you know, transform the world and, and make all the good things that happen for the internet when you're just essentially reacting to bad ideas that other people have. Um, and so the 550 Challenges is, is in and of itself, it's not a standalone initiative. It's meant to be a, a common goal, a shared destination um, for all the existing initiatives. And, and so, you know, we'll, we'll essentially pull people together, create, you know, communication groups, common um, distributions, common Twitter feeds. In other words, we use all the Internet's capabilities to unite and, and coordinate um, towards connecting everyone on Earth over the next six years um, to the Internet. So in general, I mean, so the internet, uh, John Perry Barlow, who's uh, in the sky for our session here, um, I guess he got on the internet or the precursors to it back in 1986. Um, 1985. 1985. Uh, and, and he worked pretty hard, to, and he, I think maybe he'll tell us some of that story, but it was pretty hard to get on the internet in those days. Um, I was working at Bell Laboratories in the 90s, and so I'd had access to the internet around 1991. And then come around 1996, uh, when the Telecom Act of 1996 was um, ratified or you know, signed in the Library of Congress, there was about 36 million people on the internet. So now, um, depending on who you ask, we're up to about 2 billion. And you know, everybody's always known there's something special about the internet, and, we're, and we haven't really always been great at articulating of what it might be that's special and what needs to be um, protected. And I think one of the framings that I'm coming around to is that it, what the internet does is essentially resets the you know, rules of engagement between people on Earth in the sense that normally I'll you know, engage with my neighbors or I'll engage with people in other countries filtered through the fact that I'm an American citizen and, and, and they may be a French citizen. But the internet really gives you kind of a direct human to human ability to interact and it's really that direct capability that you know we want to protect and again the people there's a lot of people working advocating uh, internet issues and and the and and the sense of passion that people have seems very similar to you know a patriotism that you know people have for their countries um, but again 
it's hard to know, you know, well, is that patriotism to cyberspace and, you know, where are the limits for sovereignty and, and how does the cyberspace sovereignty relate to physical sovereignty? And so these are all issues that we need to figure out as, as we move forward. And, and I've pulled together uh, a gracious, uh, esteemed panel here to, to essentially ask these questions and think about them. I don't think we'll necessarily have tons of answers today. This is essentially a starting point and, and, and to think about what types of questions are important to answer. Now, as far as the challenge itself, um, assuming you think it's a good idea to connect everyone in the world to the internet, and not, if not everybody necessarily would, you essentially have three challenges. One, you have a physical challenge of getting everyone connected. Uh, and given that we haven't been able to provide you know, clean drinking water or protect people from conflicts all, all around the world or uh, uh, survival of uh, you know, safety in, in, in shelter, et cetera, you know, there's plenty of physical challenges to make that happen. And then there's sort of political challenges. Again, the, the issues that John Perry Barlow has been working on for 20 years, and he's just about to solve, I'm sure, about <laughs> sovereignty and, and what does it mean? What is the relationship between the, the virtual and the physical? And then let's say you figure that out, and then it, there's sort of the, the, the value proposition of the Internet itself. What is the sort of the social issue? So in, in the United States, we have Internet access reaching about 90% of the population, but only 65% actually connect. And so why is that? Why isn't the value proposition of the Internet adequate to get everyone connected? And so there's issues about that, or maybe it's too expensive, or the value proposition isn't uh, sufficient. And so these are all issues that we need to figure out. And in the end, um, you also, in terms of implementing a sort of new mode of thinking about civilization, you need to deal with the, the, the darker sides of human nature in, in the sense that, you know, if we were in heaven, you wouldn't need a bunch of rules in terms to protect each other, you know, protect us from each other. But on the internet, you do. Um, I mean, you just kind of have to look at your spam folder to, to kind of really be a little frightened about what's out there on the Internet. And so, again, these are all things, issues that we need to navigate uh, on the way forward. So, John, um, we'll go ahead and have you just get us started kind of framing out your journey. Um, and, again, when, when you posted the Declaration of Independence of Cyberspace in '96. Uh, there was only about 36 million people on the internet. I mean, do you, are you, do you still think we need a declaration of independence of cyberspace? Well, you know, I, one point of clarification, uh, when I wrote that, and, and the next time I, I write a, a manifesto that's going to become a, a global watchword, I'm going to make sure that I don't just think I'm sending something to my friends where I'm... Uh, uh, I'm imitating the highfalutin style of somebody who's been dead for a couple hundred years. Um, uh, it, it ended up being a little over the top in its, in its style. But I don't think that what I said in that was fundamentally wrong. What I, I, I wasn't declaring independence in the same way that, say, the United States declared independence from, from England. What I felt that I was doing was stating a, uh, a fact, which was that it was probably not going to be possible for the existing uh, nation states to exert uh, sovereignty over this borderless realm and that most efforts to do so would, would end in mischief and harm to the great work that we were all engaged in creating in, in, in finding a unified space for humans to inhabit. Uh, and, you know, it, it's become popular to debunk that based on the fact that, of course, uh, there is localized censorship, whether it's the sort that China imposes, and I think that, that, that the Chinese censorship, as Rebecca can discuss, is much more nuanced and, and uh, in some ways ineffective than it is regarded to be on this side of the, of the Pacific. But there's also the fact that, for example, uh, Google Google has to protect the people of Thailand against uh, against bad material about their king as a as a precondition of of having a business in Thailand, uh, and uh, 
they have to protect the people of Turkey from uh, ill-stated ill, uh, words about Kemal Ataturk uh, as a condition of having a business in Turkey. And, you know, there are all these local variations that are possible to exert some authority over. On the other hand, I would say that it's the case that anybody in Turkey who wants to go to websites that are critical of Kemal Ataturk can find them. Uh, and so there is both, I mean, as is, as is true with many things, what's happened is a both and. There is the exertion of sovereignty uh, by parts of the physical world over the internet, and yet at the same time it is in in its very nature anti-sovereign. Uh, there is a declaration of property over many of the things on the internet, and this we will go into at much greater length. Uh, I don't think that property naturally adheres to anything that doesn't that isn't made out of atoms. And uh, trying to deal with expression and the fruits of thought as though they were no different from a toaster is going to get us into a lot of trouble and already is. Uh, it There are jurisdictional problems where practically everything is, is overextending itself. I had an interesting conversation last night in, in public with the, the human rights ambassadors of the United Nations who were being dressed by the deputy secretary for Homeland Security, Jane Lute. And I asked her, uh, what were the, the boundaries of the United States of America as she understood them these days? Uh, since just before Thanksgiving, the Department of Homeland Security had shut down over 70 websites, most of them foreign, uh, because there was supposedly copyrighted material on these websites. There was no, there was no process by which they were warned or which they could appeal. They just simply had their their names removed from the DNS table that was being maintained by an American registrar. And that was, that was all the jurisdiction that Homeland Security needed, apparently. She actually refused to, to answer the question in the particular because she said there were ongoing cases, but then refused to answer it in any way in the general which I found a little alarming. And I think that that this has been generally the case. Uh, as far back as the 90s, I can remember being in the White House and, and arguing with them about cryptography and saying, what for the purposes of this discussion are the borders of the United States? Because we were talking about exporting uh, strong cryptography past, out of the borders of the United States. And one of them said, we don't find that that's a very useful question to ask around here. Okay. Well, it's a not, it's a useful question to start as, asking, and I and I think my perspective over this long period of time is that it it becomes a critical question to ask, and we have the other question that we have to ask is if we cannot endow imposed rights by law, and if we cannot endow laws that will protect us, how do we govern cyberspace? And this is still a completely open question, and I hope we can take that up today. Okay, great. Let me bring in Rebecca McKinnon. Um, now, Rebecca, you've named your book uh, Consent of the Networked. Uh, is there a story behind that? Or, I mean, it seems mm -hmm. to be a, the last people that um, sort of invented that, the, uh, the consent of the governed, um, you know, they went off and created a country. I mean, what is there, you know, can you give some background well, on I, that? I mean, the, the, the point of the book actually deals a great deal with some of the, the, the problems that, that Barlow just described, um, which is that, it, you know, um, it, it, democracy and sort of the notion of consent of the governed was a political innovation, you know, um, that, that kind of we, we evolved as a society from assuming that the divine right of kings was the only way to um, organize power and governance and eventually evolved to the notion that that uh, government is illegitimate without consent of the governed. Um, but that, that notion um, and the way it's been implemented has been organized around nation states with national borders, right? Uh, and Barlow, I think, very clearly outlined how that doesn't work very well, sort of the, the construct of sovereignty 
uh, and state power, which, you know, there's a reason we have government, which is, is that, it, you know, you need to organize society, you need to deal with security and crime issues and so on, and there's a reason why we have government in physical spaces. Um, but the way in which we hold government accountable and the way in which we constrain the abuse of power in a physical democracy, or at least the way, you know, ideally the way it's supposed to work at least. Um, obviously, in practice, there are always problems um, and issues. But, uh, you know, at least in the physical world, we have a basic kind of model for how you constrain the abuse of power, how, how you kind of balance out different interests. Um, and how you construct, at least ideally, a system that's based on consent of the governed that at least, you know, has some hope of, of working. Um, but in, in a digitally interconnected world, um, when you overlap, overlay cyberspace across, you know, the nation state, it doesn't map very well. And so you get the problems like, you know, Barlow describes that, uh, the United States, uh, you know, the United States Congress, you know, uh, almost, you know, came very close to passing uh, a, a law on copyright protection based on, um, you know, at least what some constituencies in this country wanted passed. Um, but it was going to affect people all over the world who use the Internet who have no way of holding accountable the people passing that law. You know, fortunately, at least American internet users kind of stepped up and said, hey, wait a minute, this doesn't work for us either. We kind of um, do not consent to this law, and we stopped it. But if, if it had been the kind of situation where the American people had not stopped it or had actually consented to it, um, thought it was a good idea for, were convinced it was a good idea for some reason, but it was negatively affecting everybody else in the world, you know, too bad, right? Uh, so that's, a, that's a, a mismatch of kind of jurisdiction and sovereignty that's very troubling because it's, it's, it, lacks it lacks global legitimacy for, you know, the bulk of Internet or for most Internet users on the planet who did not vote for anybody in our government. Um, so that's kind of one mismatch. Um, the other... The other issue just has to do with the fact that, of, of course, the, the, the Internet um, is made up of, you know, a lot of commercial services, a lot of online communities, you know, all kinds of different platforms, um, uh, uh, service providers, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and so you have, uh, you know, Facebook just IPO'd, so, um, uh, you know, just to use the Facebook analogy. Um, uh, Facebook has well, created your book this. Called Facebookistan. Yeah, Facebookistan, the right. kingdom of Facebookistan. It, you know, fa Facebook is this glo you know this international community of, of Facebook users, and uh, you could call call the people users, you could call them constituents, whatever you want to call them. Uh, but the the uh, those who govern and rule Facebookistan, you know, have created terms of service, and they say, well, you clicked agree, and you're using the service, so therefore you must consent, and therefore we can change the privacy policies whenever we feel like it, and, uh, you know, we've got certain rules around what, you know, how your identity needs to uh, work, and how you need to be required to use your real name, and if you don't use your real name and it gets reported, we can deactivate your account, even if you're a dissident who might get tortured, you know, as a result of, you know, the activism that you're doing. Um, but they've, they've created this sort of private governance system that overlaps over the entire world, you know, or at least all world, uh, most countries, uh, except for those with so little internet access it doesn't matter, and those that block Facebook, like China. Um, but uh, and, and this works positively and negatively, right? So you've, we saw last year how people in the Middle East and North Africa used this global community, this global platform, to challenge the sovereignty of their phys physical governments um, successfully in a couple of cases. Um, 
On the other hand, you've, you've seen situations like, you know, people in Iran getting tortured for their Facebook passwords. Uh, and because everybody on there, you know, for the most part is using their real name, then, uh, you know, the, the police can then go track down everybody's friends um, who are talking to them about political matters or working with them to organize. Um, and so then, so then there's this question of uh, to what extent are these private sovereigns of cyberspace accountable to their constituents? To what extent are they concerned with the rights um, of, of everybody who's using the network, not just saying, well, the majority of people are fine with it, we're growing, so, you know, stop complaining, you know, you're, you're kind of just a, a marginal minority that doesn't really matter for our business. Um, and, and so kind of how is the way in which these platforms are evolving going to affect the potential for us to use these tools democratically and how is that going to affect our relationship with our physical governments and ultimately our physical freedom you know this plays out and inter interacts in ways that we don't have good mechanisms or frameworks of even thinking about it to deal with it so ultimately um, you know if if governance you know and not talking about autocratic governance but if governance that actually serves people is about not only providing services and security, but constraining abuse of power um, and holding power accountable. The systems of physical sovereignty, geopolitics, and also business practices, the way businesses are run and governed, corporate governance, don't work to constrain the abuse of power and hold the exercise of power accountable across this globally interconnected set of digital networks that, right. that comprises the internet. And we're a long way from figuring out, you know, how to get there. Right, so like I said, our, our job uh, today is to pose questions. We're not necessarily have answers. Um, Shalini Venturelli uh, is a professor at American University. Um, so you've spent a lot of time watching what the UN is doing in this, in their whole ecosystem. Um, what have they figured out or not figured out? Okay. Um, first of all, thank you, uh, Dan, for organizing this and for uh, inviting us. Uh, I have to say that uh, my students have been reading uh, John Perry Barlow's manifesto now for more than a decade. And Rebecca, you'll be happy to know they're going to be reading your book uh, in, in, in my classes. So, uh, you know, I'm just uh, delighted to be here on the panel with you. Um, yeah, um, I have had an association with the UN, I think going back to my teenage years when, uh, you know, at the age of 17, I got my first job in the United Nations. And since then have been, you know, in all kinds of consulting committees as expert advisors into different agencies, UN Development Program, uh, the UNESCO, the ITU, and, and so, so that I have a sort of inside-outside understanding, and, and John Perry Barlow can perhaps, and maybe even you, Rebecca, since you were there recently, can comment on whether or not you are feeling more hopeful after uh, meeting with everyone there yesterday. Um, but I have to tell you, I have a, I have a grimmer understanding of um, the commitment of the UN system, both as a structure and in terms of the actors, um, uh, the goodwill of the actors, uh, commitment to um, access to communication and open communication. Um, what I'd like to address is uh, a way of thinking about the problem in uh, the UN system in terms of hurdles to open uh, borderless communication. <laughs> Also, some of the short-sightedness of U.S. policy on this matter, and then perhaps um, point to a way, you're right, we can't answer it, but point to a way of thinking about uh, the way forward. Um, probably the most um, prescient understanding of what the possibilities of an internet in open, borderless uh, communication space. Um, I haven't found anything better than um, a couple of sentences in an 1813 letter that Jefferson wrote to Isaac McPherson. And um, he articulated it not in t only in terms of the internet, but on what's coming down the pike. Because I've always maintained that really um, communication is about the collision of minds. And this process began over a very long time period, beginning with printing, when minds collided on the page. And the page was 
something that could cross borders. And so ideas could cross borders. But he wrote that ideas should freely spread from one to another over the globe for the moral and mutual benefit or instruction of man and the improvement of his condition. Now the basic purpose of the spread of ideas is for knowledge and for the improvement of the human condition. Like fire, expansible all over space, and like the air in which we breathe and move, and this is the really important terms that he used, which point to the future of where communication will be going. Like the air we breathe and move and have our physical being incapable of confinement or, or exclusive appropriation, and, and that's what Rebecca just mentioned, incapable of confinement or exclusive appropriation. It's a reminder that the argument began about man. It is not about nations. It is not about different cultures. The argument began about man and the universal rights of speech and ideas spreading like air and fire. Now, the problem with the UN is deeply, deeply rooted. And like all root problems, they're very hard to resolve by simple modifications. In my view, that root problem, after many, many years of careful analysis and looking how rationales are provided, because we experts who are looking at various things will advance recommendations for improving things and will have them overturned or dismissed or some other strange version will ensue that is then presented to the member states. And so tracing it back, uh, and I just mentioned this to Dan when I came in, tracing it back, it goes to the Faustian bargain, and if I may call it the Faustian curse, that we Americans entered into on one fateful day in 1948, when we basically you know, made, made a practical compromise with Papa Stalin. And so we had the, this beautiful document, the UN Declaration of Human Rights, and we put in Article 19 as a kind of extrapolation of our vision of freedom of speech, which then did spread around the world. But then we slapped in the hole as big as a Hummer into which you know, any government could just drive through, and that's Article 29. And if I just read you that in the exercise of these rights and freedoms, everyone shall be subject to limitations, and I'll skip the intervening, uh, such as requirements of morality, public order, and general welfare. Well, obviously. Morality, public order, and general welfare determined by regimes. So regimes version of what is order in human rights, especially in Article 19, um, because it is intangible, because it arises from the human conscience, because it's about the collision of minds, and it, because it affects values. And so who's gonna determine that? Obviously not individuals, it, it is the states themselves. This you can see in 2000, so you jump from 1948 to 2000. Um, Dan mentioned to me, let's talk about the UN Millennium Challenge Goals. So in the Millennium Challenge Goals, you find something really interesting. There's something conspicuous for its absence. Every kind of right is referred to except the rights of speech, freedom of expression. That is just, just ignored completely. Um, and, uh, you know, it's sort of... Article 29 is obviously the dream of Caesar. It is the dream of Caesar going back to the beginning of time. And it makes the freedom of speech right highly vulnerable. And you can see that in the Millennium Challenge Goals. In 2011, which was last year, a decade after the Millennium Challenge Goals, you see the report on the Millennium Challenge Goals, which is the blueprint for where the UN wants to go in terms of its A-level priorities. You see, again, no mention of freedom of expression and freedom of speech. Everything else is mentioned, rights to security, rights to development, um, which beg the question of how do you get those rights? There's, as Hannah Arendt pointed out, you can't claim rights without the right of speech. That is the only right that allows you to stand up and claim the other rights. In other words, it's the right to have rights. The second thing that's going on, obviously, in the UN is this deadly convergence of cross-national regulatory controls. 
It's almost like um, back in 1995, 96, uh, John Perry Barlow mentioned he went into the White House. I was on the other side of the Atlantic in Europe, and I attended meetings between the US government and the European government, which was led at the time by France. And the French were, you know, they, they, they have a kind of an insight that somehow, you know, always is dead on in terms of recognizing the nature of the threat. And they recognize immediately and instantaneously that the internet um, had at its basis in you know, the entire protocol layer, um, you know, John Postel, the guardian of this constitution of the internet, they recognize that it encapsulated you know, these open speech, consensus-driven, um, anti-social control values. And they reminded the Americans, listen, we have communication regulation and don't think just because this is a new technology um, that is coming out of America that somehow it's not subject to our existing rules and regulations and thereupon they spent the next decade proving to Americans how they can do it and these are this, these are democratic countries in, in, in Europe the next thing I noticed was Singapore superb and superlative understanding of social control of communication space, while still not being a brutal dictatorship, right? But definitely a, a communication space governed by censorship codes. Both the French model and the Singapore model then went viral. They basically went viral. Every country was copying them, adopting them. China's whole system was kind of, the genesis of it was the success of the Singapore model, completely digitized uh, state uh, in which a big brother knows every single thing you do from brushing your teeth in the morning to what you said to your friend. You go in Singapore and you teach your students, they're afraid to raise their hand. They'll call you in the dead of night to go out to have, you know, take out somewhere, and then they'll tell you what they really think. Um, and, and so, you know, every regime dreams of that kind of order of social control. So this kind of convergence of cross-national regulatory control, which is, you know, on a fairly clipped track. It, it is not on, on the decline. And finally, the agencies of the UN themselves that actively take a proactive role in expanding speech control. And the UN Human Rights Council is, of course, notorious for this. You have the guardians of human rights being um, the worst abusers, the most barbaric dictatorships, being the guardians of the uni universal rights of man. Um, and the new types of ideas that people have to be protected from the criticism of their values and their beliefs and their ideology. Um, something, again, that they very much wish to achieve through a UN platform so it becomes international law. Now, there's a sort of sliding scale here in terms of US involvement. Um, I, I notice in successive administrations, we're sort of gradually and incrementally giving ground here and there on these questions of speech. So instead of doing what you know, following Jefferson's vision, we're saying, okay, we'll cut a little corner here, we'll cut a little corner here with this document and that document, change the wording here, just so that we can participate in this system. Um, so, uh, at the, the, you know, the outcome of this, the effect of this, is the digital magnification and that's what the digital universe does. It magnifies. It exponentially magnifies these phenomena. So the digital ma ma magnification of cultural absolutism and speech absolutism and atavism, whereby f the free speech struggles of the past uh, become almost irrelevant. Now, what does US policy on this um, say in terms of really active, proactive policy? Uh, I'm, I'm gonna look at something that uh, Rebecca talks about and I'd be really interested in your view on this. But uh, the US, it seems to me, in terms of its foreign policy towards the rest of the world on speech rights, is really consumed with public diplomacy and soft power, first and foremost, which in a sense is marketing. Okay, yeah, that has its usefulness. Does it advance the cause of free speech? Absolutely not. The other one is internet freedom, which sounds great. I think it just sounds great, but it's a concept, guess what, whose fate is tied to a technology. 
So you're saying, you know, that a, a particular technology, you know, is a human right and that we should keep it free, but down the road there will be other technologies. The internet will, you know, in less than 50 years, maybe even disconnected from physical devices, right? Uh, so XYZ technology, ABC technology, should we then reinvent um, the notion of freedom and tie it to those future technologies? So what I'm saying is it's not a fundamental principle that is being advanced with respect to the speech rights of mankind through this very limited notion of internet freedom. Because the speech rights of mankind transcend all communication technologies. And they have never been and never should be technologically confined. So what would I suggest, and I'll just conclude with that, in terms of a way of thinking forward. I think that Dan began with the 550 challenge and earlier, I think over the past decade you've been working at this and John Perry Barlow's working at this and Aunt Rebecca, you've been in the field working in this, is that I think if we use the word um, let's emancipate the internet, let's emancipate cyber, the cyberspace, that wouldn't be too much of a stretch of an exaggerated term to use. And I would add to that, emancipate the internet from the Faustian compact. The compact that has generated a virtuous cycle since 1948. We are not able to advance speech rights because of the Constitution of the United States, which is the basis of all international law, has, you know, basically has a self-canceling mechanism where Article 19 is canceled out by Article 29. And so there isn't any basis for advancing fundamental laws with respect to speech rights. And um, so uh, what I would suggest is that we are at a time, and this is what makes it so exciting to be in the second decade of the 21st century, is that there is a stirring in mankind going on. The effects of the internet on the ground, uh, the social media tools that have become available, and also a crisis of frustration with the hurdles and obstacles to human flourishing that are you know, present in so many societies, whether it's caused by cultural, whether it's caused by politics, whether it's caused by globalization. But this frustration of finding a way to connect to these technologies and use them to mobilize social action to transform societies at the local level. That is a huge, huge opportunity to think about a new kind of concept going forward in this emancipation project for, for the internet. Um, so commencing a campaign, for example, um, the Occupy movement has sort of provided a meme which is to say that let's not wait for laws to catch up because they'll never catch up. As I just mentioned, the, the structural issue with international law is that it cannot be disconnected from its constitution. So it's never going to catch up. And the idea is a global citizen movement, a global citizen occupied digital culture movement, which was just briefly demonstrated just in the last couple of weeks uh, when several sites went dark, uh, led, by, led by Reddit. Um, across all digital platforms. Um, people are stirring, they're ready for this. They're, they are frustrated with the blockages, uh, the constant social controls that prevent them from achieving and fulfilling their dreams around the world. Um, and I think that that kind of uh, global citizen movement to create digital sovereignty, you know, going back to what uh, John Perry Barlow had talked about, that, that moment is ripe. Uh, because I can assure you, you know, and I'm not saying this cynically, I don't think the solution will come from nation state laws. Okay, excellent. And so hold that thought and we're going to change gears a little bit and bring the other panelists on board. Now Paul, I invited you here to talk about Telecom Sans Frontier, but you've had quite a journey through the communication policy world from Senator Rockefeller's office uh, to the FCC and to the UN. Um, but go ahead and, and sort of just, if you could just sort of summarize your feeling about where things are going and, and how Telecom Sans Frontier fits into that. Sure, so um, thanks for having me. I'm Paul Margie. I'm the US representative of Telecom Sans Frontier, Telecom Without Borders. And so I guess our mission is a very small piece of what was being talked about today. We care a lot about access to communications. That's our goal. but 
we do it in some very narrow places. So we have three main things that we try to do. Um, two of them are in uh, emergencies, and one is in longer-term emergencies in between the critical ones. So um, uh, we're a 12-year-old organization with deployment bases in Europe, in Nicaragua, and in Thailand. Uh, we've got emergency response personnel that are ready 24 hours a day to deploy anywhere in the world and set up communications facilities within 24 hours of a, of a disaster or an emergency or a conflict. Um, and what we do is, when we get there, uh, number one, we set up an emergency telecom uh, internet access hub for the emergency response community, whether those are search and rescue teams, medical teams, um, UN uh, folks, local uh, uh, emergency responders, and we try to give them, the as soon as they arrive, uh, access to the internet, access to other telecommunications tools, uh, so that they can do their jobs. And you know, we heard a little bit about how some of the logistical problems of getting equipment to everyone in the world are so uh, difficult, and that we haven't solved these for things like water and sanitation. And I guess our uh, take on that is that part of the reason we haven't solved them for water and sanitation is because of a lack of access to telecommunications, a lack of access to the internet. Um, you know, just imagine trying to do your jobs without access to the network tools that you have. And in an emergency, especially in the first days of the emergency, uh, lacking access to uh, networks can be crippling. And so we try to make sure that the, the most important folks in those first days, the guys that are digging through the rubble, um, the, the, the people who are trying to figure out what medical supplies to bring in, have the best possible um, uh, connectivity that they can have. Uh, the second thing we do in emergencies is we go to the survivors camps and we provide free telephone calls to people who survived the disaster. So we'll go and give a voucher to each family in the camps. The camps will then, we set up a table like this, um, we set up a satellite um, facility usually, uh, and then we give each family a free uh, uh, three minute phone call to whoever they want. Usually the folks are trying to reach family members to tell them that they're alive, uh, that some family members are, are dead, um, try to reconnect families that have been divided between camps, which is very frequent in big disasters, or to try to engage in self-help where they want to, um, uh, uh, in, in places where the governments have, have been decimated by a disaster like in Haiti, um, they want to make sure that they can use their family resources in order to get help. Um, uh, you know, when is the Western Union money going to be available so I don't have to walk uh, halfway across town and wait in line all day on the wrong day. Um, and then the third thing we do is in between these, these critical events, we've got these exceptional people um, placed around the world and we do long-term emergency work. And we try to use the power of these technologies to, uh, uh, to help UN agencies, local NGOs, government, whoever it is, local communities, uh, solve uh, long-term problems. And so. We had a long-term project in Niger where some very smart people had figured out that um, price fluctuations in commodities, in food commodities, could be tracked in such a way that you could predict food insecurity months in advance. Um, the problem was being able to gather that information in a reliable way and feed it into a central point quickly um, and uh, in a way where you knew exactly when it had been gathered and so that it was uh, reliable. Um, so we help them by setting up a kind of a circuit riding team of people with a set of nodes so that people could communicate more easily and, and radically reduce the amount of time between gathering that information and putting that information into action. We, we work in uh, Nicaragua with the government uh, fighting dengue fever. I don't know how many of you have worked down there, but dengue fever is a terrible disease um, and there are limited resources to fight it. We try to use mobile technologies to allow them to marshal the forces that they do have most effectively against the particular communities that have the biggest dengue fever outbreak that day for, for spraying, for example, or so that we can track where the disease, help them track where the disease is so that they, uh, they, they can put the resources in the right place. Or we have a, a project that we work on with um, uh, the Oxford University Health System on the border between Myanmar and, Bor uh, and um, Thailand. Uh, where there are a string of refugee camps and uh, in a, a heavily malarial area. And a lot of the people that are coming over are pregnant women, pregnant women who get malaria. It's a, it, malaria is bad to begin with. If you're pregnant, it's, it's a lot worse. And so the uh, Oxford, working with the leading medical school in Thailand, 
has set up a system to treat these folks as they come across, um, but it was in a completely unconnected area, and so we helped them uh, network that area as well. So the three big things we do, you know, one is we make sure that any emergency responder as soon as possible um, has connectivity in a disaster, whether that's, you know, Haiti or the Asian um, uh, uh, tsunami, or uh, we spent months and months in, um, in, in Libya this year, um, or last year. Uh, and number two is we try to get to the actual people who are suffering, uh, who are uh, disconnected, and try to make sure that they are connected at least minimally so that they can, um, they can use some of these networks to, to help themselves. And then third, in between emergencies, we, uh, we try to use our terrific uh, uh, people around the world to use these same tools for longer term emergencies. Great. Okay, so we're going to do a speed round in a little bit uh, and, and start thinking about your questions. Um, John Bergmeier, we're talking about connecting everyone on Earth, but we haven't even managed that in America, right? So wh where do we stand on that? Yeah, the last, the, the very last people are very hard to connect. Uh, there's no getting around that. I think that universal internet access worldwide and in the United States is just a hard, practical issue. It's not really one that uh, is amenable to just theoretical speculation. You need to get down on the ground. You need to figure out what the challenges is in each community. And probably the best way to make sure that each community gets connected is to make sure that there's a constituency in the community that wants internet access and that knows what the challenges are, that knows what the geography is, and knows what the population is. Um, so essentially, public knowledge, we have supported various policies that enable communities to help themselves. Uh, we think that you know, wireless internet access uh, in communities is a, a very strong policy. Uh, and I think public policy should be focused on getting rid of what the, the largest barriers are to communities getting connected. Uh, one instance of this would be just backhaul access. Um, it's not that one house has trouble communicating to another house or that last mile infrastructure within a rural community might be challenging. It's getting that community attached to the wider network. And uh, how do you uh, direct resources to make sure that the uh, infrastructure can support that? Right. Okay, John, we're going to come back to you. Is there any summary points you want to make from what you heard? I think. It would be nice if we could leave today with at least some seed ideas of sort of the direction, the next direction we need to take. I mean, so John Barlow, what's your feeling as kind of these first baby steps we should be making now that we've got two billion people on the internet? If we didn't lose you. Okay, so we lost. <laughs> Go ahead, John. I, I hope that we'll be able to have a bit more of a conversation now that we've all made our statements. Yes. Uh, but it, it, there were several things that I that struck me as we went through this. Uh, one of them is there is still an underlying sense that uh, there are informational no's and no nots, uh, and I, I or haves and have nots, and and I. I am sensitive to that. I've spent a lot of time in Africa trying to help with that problem years ago. Uh, but I believe that it's more a matter of, of informational uh, haves and don't have yet, but will have shortly. I mean, there are already more cell phones on this planet than there are toilets. And most of those cell phones are going to be smartphones uh, relatively rapidly. Now, I don't think that the existing governance is is even sort of ready for this eventuality, uh, but it's coming anyway. Uh, another thing, you know, I, I've been troubling myself with the difference between bills of rights and terms of service, obviously, for quite a while now. But I, I had a visit with the, with the human rights ambassadors the other day to Google, and something occurred to me that was really kind of startling, and I, I don't know, I haven't, I haven't had a chance to think this all the way through, but given the paralysis and fibrillation of almost every nation state's government, it struck me that Google had a form of governance that was quite a bit more responsive than ours and actually quite a bit more directed to the desires of its constituents, namely the people who do business with Go over Google. Uh, and this could be said of Facebook and a number of other things. I mean, when, when these services haul something out that feels like an abridgment of the rights of their users, uh, the users generally are so 
adamant about their opposition that they get hauled right back in. I mean, Google Buzz lasted about three days, it seems, uh, because it was just wildly unpopular. Uh, there, I, I noticed uh, we, we had a presentation from the girl who is in charge of public policy over YouTube videos. Uh, it was very interesting finding out how they actually censor YouTube videos, and they do. But it, it's a it's a crowdsourced censoring system. If more than a hundred users flag something as being offensive over a fairly short period of time, then they take a look at it, uh, and eventually it, there's a kind of vote that is more dependent on the community's uh, disgust or or opposition than on the government's. So I, you know, I think there's the beginning of something hopeful in these entities themselves. And I, don't, I don't want to be completely sanguine about it because nobody elected them, but you know, I don't feel like I elected anybody in Congress at this point. I mean, I, I feel completely cut off from any sense of of their accountability to me as a voter, and I think most Americans do. Uh, finally, one of the things that I've been toying with, and I'd be interested to hear uh, some of the, the reactions to this. You know, there, in, in law, there's, a, there's always a question about standing. Uh, you know, who has standing, who can, who can uh, come into the court and say that, that their rights have been abused or that the law has been violated in regard to them. Uh, and there's, there's been, over the course of time, uh, a lot of litigation about whether or not nature has standing. And now, in most cases, it's regarded as having, having standing. I think that we can extend that legal principle to starting to look at endowing speech itself, ideas themselves, knowledge itself, with standing and rights. I think it's a lot easier to go forward and say, we are in favor of the free flow of information and we are against anything that impedes that, rather than saying, we are preserving the rights of this or that individual in this or that jurisdiction to speak his mind. Because if you can get countries to understand the, for one thing, the, the, the critical economic value that adheres to free informational flow, they may be somewhat more willing to concede that there are things that they don't like that ought to be expressed and, are, and, and in the overall best interests of, them, uh, of their economy and their political, uh, uh, their, their political development uh, would be better to leave expressed. Now, this is going to be tough because you've got an awful lot of people who, and institutions, not so much people, but you have a lot of institutions that are trying to preserve the industrial period and trying to preserve all the economic understandings of the industrial period and trying to preserve their own broken business models by claiming that they own speech. That expression is no different from a toaster and, that, and it's something that they own and if somebody, if somebody hears some bit of speech that they haven't paid for that they are stealing it somehow. And these folks and institutions have become extremely powerful in Geneva and in Washington. Uh, I talked to the, the, the fellow who's the head of cybersecurity for the National Security Council last night, and he said, well, surely you believe that the United States needs to do everything it can to stop this terrible abuse of our intellectual property overseas. And I said, well, I, you know, some of that is, <laughs> is my expression too, and I, and personally, I would rather have people singing my songs than having the internet being compromised so that you can stop somebody from hearing them. So let me get a reaction from the panel. Anybody want to speak to that from the panel here? Well, you know, I, I think John has pointed out something. He said earlier, uh, you know, you really cannot um, enforce property rights in a world uh, that transcends atoms. Um, and, I, and I think that was a very insightful comment. We actually have a crisis of authorship in, in cy cyberspace. We are going through that crisis right now. And, and John has put his finger on it. Um, not only is it going to be impossible to, you know, you can come up with the most, the smartest laws, honestly. Y you can even have a, you know, societal consensus about those laws. Currently the issue is that, oh, well, you know, these, 
These uh, laws are highly contentious. We've got different industries, the old media, the new media industry polarized, and we've got people on the left and right ideologically polarized. So we've got all these interest groups all over the place. But let's say hypothetically, you know, you have a, a kind of a draft legislation uh, that I, I have no doubt it will pass. Uh, eventually something will pass. Um, uh, and, and so you can sort of argue, well, this has the consensus of, you know, across party and of the major social groups who've come around. Okay, so what? It still can't really, I mean, it's not going to stop the bleeding. Um, and so we have to think in a different way about authorship when it comes to um, idea generation. Um, because cyberspace is produce, use, diffuse. How you, there's no way to stop production of ideas. There's no way to stop exploitation and use of ideas. There's no way to stop diffusion of those ideas. So you can attach, in formal terms, some kind of property uh, label to it, um, but um, there is a kind of de facto, one would say, citizen-led sovereignty already emerging in, in cyberspace. And the, as knowledge about that citizen-led sovereignty spreads to different corners of the world, you're going to see more activism to have access to those ideas to produce, use, diffuse and to engage in that process of knowledge production. One of the most important factors historically, um, because I also study the knowledge economy, what are the key you know, catalytic factors? And one of the most important factors that we've noticed from the time of the Middle Ages to today is the factor of social exploitation. So you can produce all the patents and copyrighted intellectual property, you can invest in R&D and you know, you can sort of have a high percentage of GDP invested in the production of intangible goods, um, it, it will generate no developmental effects on your society unless and until you release it to social exploitation. And that's when the real effects take place. And they are cascading effects that benefit everyone else. I mean, that basic lesson of history uh, doesn't seem to me to be reflected in the laws that we are seeking, not only for ourselves, but that we wish to impose uh, and push others to do. Rebecca, is there anything you want to add to that? Uh, well, there's, it, you know, I, it, it would be great to just kind of sit down with a beer and, you know, have a five-hour conversation with Barlow, and I look to look forward to doing that. I mean, you know, there's a lot that he said there, but um, just to, to pick up on the one point about um, uh, his visit to Google and um, uh, the, the activism that we're seeing within a lot of these platforms. And it is very encouraging. And I was also encouraged, for instance, with uh, Google Plus, kind of the, their next uh, attempt at social networking after Buzz failed so horribly, um, that you know they started out requiring everybody to use their real names, having a real ID policy, kind of like Facebook. But users rebelled and yelled and screamed and organized against it. Um, and Google listened, and they're starting to adjust that policy. Um, and they are, you know, they, they've made privacy policy adjustments, and we're seeing them reaching out to a lot of different constituencies that have concerns about that in ways that I find encouraging. Um, you know, not that they're getting anything right by any means, but um, I, I think, you know, two things from that. Um, one is that I think users, by kind of thinking of themselves less as users and more as constituents, could be doing a lot more, even. Yeah. We could be doing a lot more to organize, um, uh, you know, engage in almost sort of collective bargaining, you know, sort of some kind of combination of shareholder activism, consumer activism, and labor activism, you know, kind of take the, you know, some combination of those mechanisms and find ways to be more organized about taking our concerns to companies um, that are running these platforms and services we depend on so heavily um, and, and find ways to kind of raise our concerns and interact with the companies about how they're shaping with these products a lot earlier on in the cycle. So rather after it rolls out and after everybody gets pissed off, you know, can you have more of a conversation earlier on about how they're developing it and can they be consulting 
different communities? Um, and what are those mechanisms? And would, can you see perhaps the companies finding ways, innovating and finding ways to, you know, as they're developing products, to reach out more to their constituencies in ways that will enable them to avoid the screw-ups like Google Buzz or what we saw with Google Plus and identity um, and create value as well. You know, it kind of increases the trust increases le the legitimacy of the way they're running and shaping and programming and engineering um, their platforms and services and ends up being of course to great commercial benefit to them because it's, it's something that people feel better about rather than you know well I have to use it because all my friends are there but I don't really trust it and, you know that wouldn't wouldn't you rather have people feeling that they have real ownership in it and real buy-in somehow. And isn't that ultimately going to be in your greater long-term commercial interest to, to innovate in ways that enable that to happen? Um, and so I, I would really hope that the most forward-thinking companies will, will really make efforts both to welcome more activism from their constituencies but also to, to think about how they can kind of, you know, take advantage of it um, and benefit from it. And that, you know, also there's, uh, of course, a lot of Internet companies are concerned about being regulated. Well, maybe there's going to be less pressure to regulate them if they sort out these problems with their constituents in advance rather than have everybody mad at them about how they screwed everybody on privacy, you know, settings or something. Right. Um, and, and so how can, you know, because, you know, the nation state regulation is so reactive and, you know, doesn't work so well in kind of dealing with technologies and innovations that we would really like to see. So, um, you know, what kind of, uh, you know, I don't know if it's uh, like management innovation or sort of political innovation within a private business with their constituents or what you want to call it. I don't even know what you really call it. Um, but there is tremendous, you know, ground for really innovative new structures to, to and processes to take place um, that we're only seeing the very kind of em embryonic sparks of at the moment. Are there any questions in the audience? Uh, we have a microphone. Bring the microphone up. Yep. My name is Li Yang. Uh, as the user of just high tech, and uh, from the beginning, we know there's a spam or scam. Uh, we, authority will handle it. But I think now if they say all kind of obstruction, spying your mobile phone or interrupt or obstruction or temper your, let's say, if election information, candidate information, or even your any personal information, there's privacy, everything. So exactly which organization or coordination or government agency would handle this? Proper, whether it's a FTC or FEC or Department of Justice, exactly they, how do they coordinate together? So, where does she turn for privacy concerns? Well, I, I can tell you, uh, I'll put on my other hat. Um, but, uh, but it, so it depends what country you're in. So, it, in the U.S., unlike the uh, Europeans, we've taken a, a privacy approach where we've regulated either individual technologies or applications or types of users or particularly sensitive pieces of information. Um, many times those have been done through individual laws and given the responsibility of them given to different parts of the government. And so um, the Europeans, on the other hand, have taken a um, more holistic approach where they have um, uh, unified legal instruments that allow you to regulate uh, privacy from one legal instrument and then give it to kind of more centralized um, uh, uh, authorities. So there's kind of positives and negatives to each of those approaches, I think. Um, but in the U.S., 
generally what's happened is when there's a privacy incident, um, uh, if it rises over some magic level, we get a new privacy law, and uh, that law will be on health information or on uh, children's privacy or on financial privacy, um, uh, and we don't have a uh, unified big one place that you can go to. So it kind of depends um, uh, on, on what piece of information you're worried about. Um, it, it, another interesting model would be the, you know, the Canadian model where they've got a, some, a little bit of both, but then they also have a privacy ombudsman kind of position within the government of privacy czar that not only looks at what all the other agencies are doing, but also looks at the privacy implications of apparently non-privacy related um, uh, regulations. And so that's, that's another way you might be able to handle it. But the answer to your question is it's kind of complicated, uh, in the U.S. at least, because it could be several different agencies. Okay, other questions? Uh, statements? Uh, John Mitchell, you wanted to make, you wanted to describe your efforts with uh, the Lawyers sure. Guild? Yeah. Just introduce yourself real quick and... Sure, I'm uh, John Mitchell, uh, an attorney in private practice here in D.C. doing antitrust, First Amendment, and copyright uh, types of issues, but I, I'm also a member of the National Lawyers Guild's uh, Committee on Democratic Communications. Uh, some of you may know the NLG as uh, sort of the boots on the ground backbone for the uh, uh, Occupy movement, but uh, the, uh, the little uh, Committee on Democratic Communications has often addressed uh, some of the uh, international uh, uh, types of uh, uh, rules of the road, treaties, and so forth, uh, dealing with uh, uh, the international counterpart to the First Amendment, and uh, it does want to sort of make itself available to uh, help assist in the legal framework for uh, some of these kinds of efforts, uh, that is, we're not the ones that understand fully the, uh, the technology of, uh, of uh, uh, behind our ability to communicate internationally. But uh, uh, to take one example, uh, as a U.S. citizen, I have a First Amendment right uh, to be free from the government suppressing my communications. And today I can communicate with someone in Singapore uh, whose government may not allow them to communicate with me which raises the interesting question then, what business does the United States have entering into a treaty that has a provision like Article 29 that says, well, we will agree with a foreign government that they can prevent their people from communicating with you or you communicating with them. Uh, it raises this now to a whole new level uh, and uh, suggests that we can no longer have a sort of bal balkanized uh, uh, freedom of speech where uh, each country is entitled to have its own uh, freedom of speech rules when uh, I, I, I as an American citizen want to claim that my government has no business prohibiting me from communicating with anybody that my internet connection will 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 normally uh, in the they can stop you from visiting you know the TSA can stop you from visiting but you can still make the call or whatever yeah absolutely yeah um, other questions, statements? Since you're permitting statements, I wanted to put in a plug and invite any of the panelists whose remarks I enjoyed very much to attend um, an international law section, DC Bar International Law Section pro bono fair at which uh, a number of human rights organizations will be presenting their work, talking individually to people. It's Thursday, February 9th, 12 to 2 p.m., Law Offices of Arnold and Porter, 555 12th Street. And uh, you're Is all welcome. Is there a website or something people can um, You can go to the DC Bar website, okay. and that'll give you information on it. Thanks. Uh, question, other questions? Go ahead. Uh, Ms. McKinnon said something interesting. She used the word buy-in. And most of human beings automatically buy into the fact that if you're born in a certain place, that place determines a lot of what you can do and what you can't do. The interesting thing, of course, about the internet or the World Wide Web is that anybody can buy in. They're so cheap in the sense that you know, your telephone or an internet connection you can buy in. The cheapness it's of that participation is both good and bad in the sense that you, know, you can express anything anywhere in the world. On the other hand, you may not have to take responsibility for it. And I think that's one of the things that we should uh, discuss, right? 
I mean, is there a distinction between buy-in and consent? Uh, um, well, buy-in, well, that, I guess that's maybe a problem with the English language. The buy-in has a no notation that you have a commitment to something. But let's face it, you, you can be outside of Egypt, and you can be fomenting a lot of problems in Egypt that you have nothing to do, do with. I mean, and if you're happy doing that, that could be bad for Egypt, but it could be good for you, you know. And those are the type of notions, I think, that uh, I'm assuming lawyers would like to discuss, you know. Anything you want to say about buy-in? Um, I'm not sure if I have anything to say about buy-in, um, but um, I, I, I think what your real point was was less about buy-in and more about people having to take responsibility and be held accountable for their actions, not just governments or companies, but individuals um, who, who might be you know, spreading lies or causing trouble. I, I, I think that's my understanding of your, your, your point. Um, or committing crimes or, or behaving irresponsibly with the technology. Is, is that sort of your point? Because if you are Putin, you wouldn't want people to do that. And are you behaving irresponsibly if you are getting Russians to say, hey, there's something wrong with your government, right? Mm -hmm. So in order, it cuts both ways. So I'm is it irresponsible agree. to give people the power to oppose their government? Is right. that what you're that, saying? That, that's another f uh, form. Right? That it's kind of buying is sort of like, it, it, in my interpretation, it's sort of a commitment, right? Right. Yeah. I guess I'm not entirely sure if I understand your entire question or point, but I, I think there are a number of issues that I seem to be picking up. Uh, one is has to do with just people taking responsibility for their actions on the internet, and a lot of people who act on the internet without taking responsibility for their actions and, and doing things that are socially irresponsible in different ways. And there's a big debate, of course, about you know whether anonymity should be allowed because if if you allow anonymity, then you know people it's easier to spam, it's easier to commit crime, it's easier to harass people, and you know spread lies and so on. Yet at the same time, uh, anonymity makes dissent possible. Um, and so, a as with so much in the physical world, uh, there are trade-offs, right? And so then, you know, y you can s certainly say, okay, well, if we try to build more accountability mechanisms into the internet so that everybody, you know, is physically kind of tied to whatever they do and they can be held responsible, does that also make dissent impossible? And does that also expose vulnerable people, minorities, people who are, are vulnerable to abuse or arrest or, you know, physical harm because the community around them doesn't like what they have to say, but they're saying something, you know, <laughs> that they have a, a, a right to say, um, that they oppose something? Um, are you eliminating the possibility that they can be heard and that they can organize for change? And so, so then the question is, you know, is, is, is that a trade-off you want to make um, in exchange for making bad people more accountable? I, I'd um, like or is, to is there, are there other ways of okay. dealing with okay. bad behavior on the internet that doesn't eliminate people's ability to conduct dissent and, and people to, who are vulnerable um, uh, to speak out and be heard. So Barlow, so, you wanted to insert uh, something? I'd like to break in here briefly, if I can do this briefly. Uh, you know, we at EFF spend an awful lot of time thinking about anonymity and responsibility. Oh, shoot. Uh, and, uh, sorry. And, you know, I, I've, I've come to feel the same way about anonymity that I, that I feel about guns. Uh, I'm from Wyoming, you know, where, where guns are part of the furniture. And I think that anonymity should be used very, very sparingly because I really believe that the only thing that can protect us from the kinds of occurrences that this gentleman is talking about is accountability. And, and there has to be accountability on a personal level for everything we manifest in cyberspace or in the world for that matter. And that requires that we know who we are. At the same time, there are circumstances where in order for speech to take place at all, and I think about places like, like Syria at the moment, 
In order for people to speak freely, they have to be able to do so anonymously. But I think there has to be a social code that we collectively develop as a species at this point about when we use anonymity and how sparingly we use it and when we allow ourselves to be accountable for our, for our words and in cyberspace, our deeds, in, set, in essence. Because that's a place where the, where the word has become flesh in a very material way. Okay. Um, Shalini, go ahead. Yeah, um, I, the, just a couple of things. The, the term came up, which I think needs elaboration. It, it's very important. The term that you used, which was consent. And I think uh, Rebecca's really critical concept of consent, um, you know, is absolutely vital to understanding um, uh, the, the nature of the issue. But I would like to add one more term to that. And that term goes back to the, the basic concept of the internet it's it's a fundamental invention uh, and the engineers that you know you know sort of encapsulated in that protocol um, this term which is the notion of consensus right so consent which can be passive you know does it doesn't necessarily have to be active consent just by using something you're consenting to it just by living in America you're consenting to its laws no one comes to you and seeks your consent to the law, and that is implicit. Uh, whereas consensus is something much more active. And so the way the internet was originally envisioned is a social space that was consensus driven in terms of the, the, the rules. And that everyone outside the space, especially institutions, um, were, uh, were not legitimate in imposing their external order to this space. In other words, whoever used and participated in that space participated also in a consensus-driven rule-governed system. And I think if we stay with that concept as we look at the internet, you know, really penetrating down to the, you know, molecular level of human life uh, in every corner of the world, Tibet, Mongolia, you name it, the remotest regions uh, where people don't even have schools but they have access to the internet. Uh, then we're talking about um, solutions, possible solutions to issues even like copyright. Um, for example, you know, what would be a consensus-driven notion of respect of authorship? Um, if it's imposed by states, it will be broken by, by, by users. Um, it has to be, be consensus-driven. I think you alluded to this uh, set of rules also. The ultimate test of whether the internet is functioning, whether the digital world is functioning, is whether or not it empowers human communities to transform their lives. That is the one and only effective test of whether, in fact, we have a functioning and functional uh, cyber world. And that is a test to which every code should be subjected. Well, um, let me pick up on that a little bit, and, and we're kind of in the final uh, run here. Now, one of the problems we have if we're going to bring internet to everyone on Earth is defining what that means. So. I mean, is what they have in China internet and we get to count those 500 million people or do we still have work to do there? And so you're saying there's, uh, there's maybe some kind of a test as to whether that connection to the internet is actually enabling human aspiration. Um, uh, there needs to be some kind of a, a way to figure that out. I mean, um, John, do you... Yes. Uh, do you think, um, I mean... What if the consensus was that, you know, what they have in, the in, in China w was not the Internet? Well, gosh, I mean, I think Rebecca is, Rebecca is better able to comment on this than I am, but I think that this, the situation in China is very complex. I mean, it's my objective, uh, personally, it's my mission in life, that everybody everywhere will one day be able to satisfy his or her curiosity about anything that can be known by people, which means that, that ultimately the Chinese ought to be able to find out everything they want to know about the Falun Gong, if, uh, if that's the issue at hand, or anything else. Uh, but I think that this is going to be a huge social transformation that has to take place. I mean, let's take in the example of China. China, most of the people who are in charge of China at this point remember the Great Cultural Revolution, which is a permanent scar on everybody's life. And they, they see the internet 
as something that would make it possible for a great cyclonic force of belief to spin itself up very rapidly in the manner that that did. And there is a natural inclination to try to place capacitance in the system that keep things from spinning up too fast. And I can understand that. Uh, but I think that as we go forward, the likelihood of that happening will be increasingly diminished because every sort of high pressure zone of belief, like the, like the great cultural revolution, will be instantly bled out by the surrounding thermodynamics of other beliefs. And I, I you know, that's, that's a, probably a hopeful view, but I think that gradually societies will come to recognize that it is in their best interest in every sense that information be able to flow freely from one mind to the next like fire illuminating the entire landscape and not just parts of it so rebecca i mean nobody has complained that uh, that i know of to say that what's going on in the uh, in china is the censorship censorship prevents it from being internet i mean i mean that would be sort of a bit of good communication if people within China said, well, actually, I don't have the internet and, mm -hmm. and I need these so dimensions in order to have the internet. So um, just to address that problem, I mean, it's, 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 I mean, technically China is still connected to the internet, right? Um, it, somebody in Beijing or Shanghai or Guangzhou or Jinan or, you know, somewhere in Gansu or whatever, most of the time they can send an email to somebody anywhere in the world and actually the email gets to them. That means they have the internet. Now, it's a filtered internet and it has a lot of controls on it. And the way it works is that the global internet enters China at about eight or nine different exchange points and there are filters put on that and deep packets inspection technology put on that so that you know if you're trying to access a range of different websites overseas that the government has decided should be blocked or if you're trying to access websites that contain certain keywords um, you'll get an error message on your browser and that's the great firewall of China in action um, and you know there are some people who complain that oh, China only has an intranet um, that's not entirely true because if it had only an intranet, it would be North Korea. Uh, in, in North Korea, you can only, unless you're like a highly privileged person with special access, you can only send access websites that are hosted within the country, and you can only communicate with it, with people that are inside the country. That's an intranet. Um, but China is connected to the outside world. People have to do business. You know, China cannot be an economic power without financial information, economic information, without small businesses, large businesses, ca communicating with their trading partners all over the world. Um, you know, Walmart and Apple and all these companies could not be operating in China unless they actually had an internet. So they do have an internet. It's just that certain kinds of speech are <coughs> constrained, you know, in terms of your ability to access certain content that's hosted outside of China. Now, if you know how to use something called a circumvention tool, um, which we probably don't have time to explain exactly how all that works, you can, you know, trick the, the, your computer connection and your ISP into thinking you're going over here, but you're actually going over there, and then ac access the site that you really want to see because it thinks you're looking at something else, and we won't explain the technical things to... to but so there are technologies to do that. Only a small minority of Chinese Internet users ha know how to use these technologies or bother to use them. Um, but then there's also another layer of censorship and surveillance that goes on in China that is, you know, not at the gateway with the international level, but because, you know, Facebook and, you know, YouTube and Blogspot and Twitter and all these different services are blocked by the Great Firewall, most Chinese internet users um, who are avid social media users are not using the brands that we've heard of. They're, they're using search engines and social media networks that are run by Chinese companies that are hosted inside China, 
you know, hosted on servers inside China. And so the Chinese government holds these companies liable for everything their users are doing. The lawyers would call it intermediary liability, very heavy liability. And so if your company is enabling too much political organization of the type that the government does not want happening, or if it's enabling the Falun Gong to dis disseminate its ideas uh, in a manner that the government thinks is out of control, you can lose your business license. So you have to set up an entire department of people to police and delete content. Now, do they do it perfectly? No, there's still a lot of people who manage to report on incidents that happen in their village or, you know, train crash that happens and then, you know, expose how the government lied about it and so on. So people, you know, it's, it's hard to control it completely, but the government imposes enough liability on these companies and enough kind of filtering at the gateway that nobody's been successful using the internet to organize an opposition party. Everybody who's tried is in jail. Uh, you know, people who've tried to disseminate treatises on multi-party democracy and political change are in jail. People who've signed on to them, uh, you know, a large percentage of them have had visits either by their police or by the party secretary at their place of employment. You know, that, that there's enough of a chilling effect to keep things within a certain set of parameters. But it's still an internet. It's, it's just an internet that that is managed. It's, it's a managed domestic, you know, I, I, I think you could make the point, and correct me, correct me if I'm wrong, Rebecca, but I, I think you could make, am I on? No, yep. Go ahead. Yeah, yep, we're listening. I, I'm sorry. I, I think you could make the point that the Chinese government actually knows the extent to which the internet is not fully controlled. Oh, totally. Uh, and you know, and is is actually in a very long process of releasing those controls. Yeah, I guess yes and no. I think I think um, to some extent the Chinese government benefits from the fact that it doesn't totally right. control it. And right. so the fact that you know, if I'm in a village somewhere and I'm able to expose malfeasance by the local officials, uh, and actually. It, you know, kind of have more of a, di use the internet to have more of a dialogue with my government and actually improve governance by using this technology, I think that actually enhances the central government's legitimacy in many ways. Um, and at least parts of the government see it that way and see it to their advantage. Now, if I use the internet to, to criticize a central of official, then that's like a, a different story. So they, they kind of prioritize what they're trying to control because they know they can't control everything. And they take advantage of actually lack of control in some areas and, and they kind of roll with it. Um, because yeah, you can't control everything and they've given up trying. But at the same time, if, if you look at what's been going on in the last few months, there are bloggers who've been blogging, you know, about kind of public affairs um, for the last, you know, five, six years who've gotten their accounts shut down and they've been allowed to exist up until recently. And that, you know, there's a leadership transition happening later this year. And a lot of stuff that has been, that the government has kind of been allowing to happen for the last several years is getting squeezed. Like a lot of Tibetan language blogs just got shut down over the past week. You know, so, so the screws are tightening. They're getting more paranoid. It's definitely not a, a linear process. And, you know, it's, it's certainly kind of hard to predict how it's going to play out. But I think to the extent that the Chinese government and the Communist Party succeeds in kind of riding this whole thing is because it's because they ride it and, and they don't try and control everything. Yeah, and, and I think that they are also completely freaked out, understandably, oh, yeah. by what's going on in the Arab world and what's going on in Russia. Absolutely. They're very yeah. freaked out. Okay, Leticia, you have a question or Hello. Twitter statement? or? Um, so I, I really appreciate this discussion, and I'm learning a lot. Um, I, I really appreciated also Professor Venturelli's comments about um, the U.S.'s sort of foreign policy or their approach to talking about the internet outside of the US in terms of internet freedom and that not really having um, an actual tangible um, or that not actually meaning much <laughs> in a lot of ways. 
Um, so I appreciate this discussion. However, I feel like um, it might be inter internalizing that same kind of agenda where we're looking a lot in how other countries are treating the internet, but we're not looking at how we understand internet freedom here in the United States. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm curious to know what the panelists think of you know, issues that we're dealing with here, especially given that we just uh, dealt with SOPA and other kind of privacy, or I'm sorry, piracy um, policies here, and also the huge digital divide that we face and what that means for especially communities of color and rural people and, and low-income communities. So I'd like to know a little bit more about that. Actually, I'm gonna, we've got about one minute left, and, and unless um, you wanna take that? Or? Yeah, we need to increase the constituency of active internet users who care about internet freedom, both in the United States and abroad. One way to do that is to focus as much on the actual getting of wires and computers in people's hands so that they can become active participants in the internet community as much as talking about you know, the, the uh, how to go about governing the internet once it's uh, been established. Now, on that thought, Maura Corbett, I, I invited Maura, she's hiding in the back there, and, and this is what she does sort of on the front lines day in, day out. Is there anything you wanted to say or invite people to follow up with you afterwards or? Great question. So Maura, you just, you just, just sort of stole my whole comment, so I don't need to do the comments. I would want to tell a secret about Mora that she used to belong to a band and she oh, played okay. on the <laughs> steps of the Capitol around 2001 on, on these issues. But go ahead. It, actually, it's funny because I don't think this is on. It is on. It is yeah. okay. Um, it was called the Internet Freedom Rally, right? Yeah. How funny. Yeah. Uh, it means a lot. That was about you know letting the bells take over the internet, which some people think they already have. But at that point, that was our biggest fear. Um, now we've got bigger issues and, you know, m maybe if it's okay, go ahead. Uh, you know, what I was going to say when I got up there that I can do is easily from back here is that, yes, the 550 challenge, what I find so important about it is, and the communications renaissance idea is that the internet is, has become more than a tech issue or a broadband issue, it is a societal issue, it is an economic issue, it is a democratic issue. It is kind of an enabler and an empowerer of, for people from all kinds of constituencies. And so that's why it's important for the 550 challenge to get it into everyone's hands because it allows everybody to be an artist, to be a creator, to be a participant in a democracy. Um, you just need a connection. Um, then it gets into the other issues. What do you do now as a global community if we're all connected? How are we going to structure it? How are we going to govern it? Um, SOPA and PIPA, uh, and I would say on, in, in a small way, in this country showed how much work we have to do in our own backyard and how little we remember how the rest of the world is watching us in what we do. And now we have you know, son of SOPA and PIPA, or if you've been paying attention long enough, the king and queen of SOPA and PIPA, which is ACTA. You know, other, other countries are, are, are watching us and repeating us. Um, if you look at it on a much broader scale, which is what Rebecca, Rebecca gets into, which I'm hoping to read in the brief respite of SOPA and PIPA and son of SOPA and PIPA, is that with the internet becoming this communications renaissance, with it comes the great responsibility to ensure that is, it is used as a force for the greater good and not as a tool of evil or repression or, you know, the wires are one thing, let's do that and let's also be mindful that we structure it and govern it in a way that doesn't leave anybody out, that uses it as a force for good, that advances our society and our democracy and our global economy. Um, and also with regard to this country, I think SOPA and PIPA, even for those of us who've, who've kind of had this fight, it's been Groundhog Day over and over again for like 20 years. Um, yeah. You know, and this wasn't, for, for people, you know, who are a little older, remember, this wasn't the first time this happened. This happened during the Communications Decency Act in the 90s. You know, a lot of people weren't around for that, but, you know, the internet dis did rise up. It was just a smaller internet. Um, and it wasn't, you know, it was still sort of a techie thing then, maybe. 
Um, but we have a rare opportunity here, and a lot of people have been talking about this, about how to leverage what we created, how to, spend, how to leverage the capital that was gathered by that effort. And it was a postpartisan or nonpartisan or bipartisan response that you saw people, you saw the occupiers and you saw the Tea Partiers fighting for internet freedom for actually the same reasons, because they sort of touched each other and came back around. And I think that that's a, a really kind of profound starting point that, you know, maybe we've screwed up everything else in the old economy and certainly how Washington operates in the old economy. But if you see the internet and technology as the new economy, we have an opportunity to learn from our mistakes and to try to try to keep it from getting tainted with the old way of doing things, both in this country and in the, in the okay. next. Okay, leave it there. We're yeah. almost on time. Thank you to the panel. Thank you, guys. And, and again, please pick up Rebecca's book uh, before you leave. That's uh, one concrete thing you can do. And um, thank you very much for attending. It's great to see you.